Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much to the organizers for the honor of uh, being invited to come to this amazing and beautiful place. So thank you very much indeed. I'm very honored. Um, so what I'm going to be talking to you today is about uh, muon spin rotation. So I'd like to first of all thank some of the people who've been involved in this work, some of my group in Oxford, um, uh, colleagues in the chemistry department, and various other people listed here also at, uh, at ISIS and PSI. You'll, you will hear a number of muon talks later on in, uh, today, so I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to uh, MUSR, just for those of you that are not familiar with it. I'm then going to talk about the muon site problem, how we determine where the muon sits in a, in a, a sample, and I will go through these various, um, uh, explaining the problem, giving some possible solutions, and then coming to this idea of what we call DFT plus mu. So I'll begin with a muon spin rotation. So the idea of muon spin rotation is that if you have a secret agent, a secret agent is supposed to go into enemy territory, learn about what's going on, and then disappear without a trace. And this is exactly what the muon does. It's the perfect secret agent. It goes into enemy territory, the sample. It learns about the magnetism locally, and then it disappears without a trace. So here is our secret agent. And what is it? So the muon is essentially a heavy electron. It has a mass which is 200 times that of the electron mass. Uh, we can have negative or positive muons, but everything you will hear about today, I think, is, is with positive muon, uh, positive uh, uh, charged muons. Um, the spin is one half, so it's just the same as an electron. But the big difference, because the mass is 200 times larger, the magnetic moment is 200 times smaller. <laughs> And this means the gyromagnetic ratio, how fast it processes in a magnetic field, is, um, is similarly smaller than that of, a, of an electron, 28 gigahertz per tesla. Here we have 135 megahertz per tesla. The big difference, of course, is the lifetime. The lifetime is only two microseconds. Compared with the electron, which essentially lives for longer than the lifetime of the universe. So uh, electrons, of course, are used in electron spin resonance. Muons are used in a similar technique, muon spin rotation. I'm not using the word resonance because, as I'll explain, you don't have to do the technique resonantly like you do in NMR or ESR. You can measure the polarization directly because nature gives you 100% polarization. So this is a rotation technique, not a, not a resonance technique. OK, so uh, a little bit of basics of how you make the muons. You, you bang protons together. They produce pions. The pion very quickly decays into uh, a muon and a neutrino. And this decay has a rather nice feature. It's a two-body decay. Because neutrinos have their spin anti-parallel to their momentum, because the pion has zero spin, the muon has to do the same. It has its spin anti-parallel to its momentum. So this nice bit of particle physics gives us 100% polarization for free. And this means that uh, we can make these beams of particles that have a speed of about a quarter the speed of light, an energy of about 4 million electron volts, and we can fire those into our sample. Zaher in the next talk will tell us about how we can reduce that energy. But in this talk, we will always be dealing with 4 million electron volts. Then the muon sits in the sample and it interacts with it. I'll tell you about that later. But then at the end of its life, maybe two microseconds later, longer or shorter, depending on the radioactive decay, it decays into a positron and a couple of neutrinos. And the rather nice thing about this decay, it was realized in the 1950s, is that it's an asymmetric decay because of parity violation. So what this means is if the muon spin was pointing to the right here, in this direction, this diagram here shows you a probability of the pion being emitted in different directions. This is actually for the maximum energy, but in the general case, you have something similar. So because of this nice feature, the positron is essentially emitted in the same direction, preferably the same di uh, direction as the muon spin is pointing. So this gives us a, m a method of, of measuring the muon spin in the sample. <coughs> 
So let me show you a picture of this and how the experiment works. So you have two detectors, a forward detector and a backward detector. Let's imagine you've applied a magnetic field and then let's have the muon coming into the sample. So it comes in with its spin anti-parallel to its momentum. Now if it dies now, what would happen is we would count more, um, more uh, accounts in this forward detector than in the backward detector. Uh, and so if we plotted a graph of counts against time, here we are at time equals zero, we have more in the forward detector than in the backward detector. But now if we let time evolve, because of this magnetic field, the muon processes. And what happens is, on average, that's this green curve, you just see radioactive decay. There are fewer muons lasting in your sample as time increases. <laughs> But what you have is this oscillation about the green line of the forward counts and the backward counts. And what you can then do is take these curves and subtract the red and the blue curve and divide by the sum, and then you get this curve here, which is just an oscillation. And this is what we generally plot. So this shows you muons processing in the sample. Now, this has happened because I've applied a magnetic field to the sample, so this is the world's most expensive magnetometer, so this would not be very useful. But of course what we do is we will generally measure a sample without a magnetic field, and then we can measure this internal field of the sample. So we're then measuring something of interest. Okay, if you want the Hollywood version of this figure, this is the, uh, this is the Pixar animation version. So the muon comes into the sample backwards, it lands into the sample which I've drawn as a glass slide. I've imagined there being a magnetic field in the sample causing the muon to process. And you can see every time it, it points towards a detector, the detector light, lights up. And you can see I've drawn this diagram over the sea outside Goa. So uh, you can see it's uh, very much in keeping with the local area. Uh, now this isn't really what the experiment looks like. It looks a little bit more like this. But here you can see four detectors and backward detectors. Here's an Oxford Instruments cryostat, uh, uh, and the sample is in the middle here. The muons are coming from the right side uh, into the experiment. And where do the experiments take place? Uh, um, a lot of them are in ISIS. This is uh, in, in Oxfordshire in the UK. Uh, also PSI, as a couple of speakers will be from PSI. I tend to do my experiments here. There is also Triumph in Canada, J Park in Japan, and some more sources, uh, possibly in Korea and China, maybe even the US, are being planned and talked about. Okay, so this is the picture of the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory near Oxford. Oxford is where I am from, is just over here. Um, this is where the muon beam is. This is the diamond light source. And we'll also be hearing about the Paul Scherer Institute, and you know, I'm sure there'll be some more pictures of this. The muon experiments take place in this building, and this is the main Ara River through uh, the north of Switzerland. Okay, so let me give, show you now a few examples of what you can do before I talk about the muon site problem. So here is some graphs of muon data. You can see oscillations. So this corresponds to muons processing in the sample. You can see the temperatures here for two different samples. And what you can see in both cases is when you get up to rather, rather warm temperatures, this is 700 millikelvin, uh, incredibly hot. Um, then you just see spin relaxation. But as you cool down in these materials, you can see an internal field developing. And these two examples, uh, rather old examples, are from organic materials. This one was the world's first purely organic ferromagnet. And what you can do with these data is you can fit a frequency. You can then plot the frequency as a function of temperature. And this shows you how the frequency for these two samples varies as a function of temperature. But remember the gyromagnetic ratio. That tells you how many megahertz per tesla. So you can immediately convert megahertz into tesla. So on the, on the right axis here, I've got magnetic field. So we now have a measurement, an excellent measurement, of magnetic field inside the sample at the muon site in millitesla. So you can measure this directly. Of course, the only problem is, where is the muon? You know, what are you actually measuring? Where is it sitting inside the sample? And this is the problem I'm going to come back to later. Okay, I'm just going to show you a few slides, a little bit of a few pictures just to flash in front of you to show you the range of things that you can do. This is a much more recent example. Uh, this one has just been published. This is cobalt titanate. Um, and what you can see here, this, in this one, temperature increases as you go down. Sorry about that. 
Here you can see spin relaxation above the phase transition in cobalt titanate. What you can see at low temperature, now two oscillations. And if you Fourier transform it, you see two peaks. So this is a case where there are two different muon sites, at least with respect to the magnetic structure. And this is something that we're, we're able to, to study uh, using DFT plus mu. I'll explain more about that later. Here is another example. Both of these examples are from PSI, actually. And this one, I think, uh, I wanted to show this because this, uh, when we first measured it, it looked like noise. Uh, so this is down at 1.6 Kelvin. The spin relaxation is up here at 20 Kelvin. And here you can just see something very, very complicated. But if you Fourier transform it, you see six frequencies. So we were able to fit this these oscillations with six individual frequencies and there are so many here because this is a charge ordered material that shows a rather complicated magnetic structure and we were able to to understand this very nicely using the muon data. Um, one other example um, these are some organic materials uh, where you have copper ions that have a spin they're linked together with organic groups and actually you can just change the organic groups and make lots of different differences and here you can just see a whole lot of different compounds again you can see the internal fields measured with uh, mu SR and um, it turns out in these materials it's very hard to measure the phase transition using heat capacity because they're low dimensional mu SR is the best technique for measuring them oh, and maybe one final example uh, this is uh, a superconductor, sodium iron arsenide doped with cobalt. It has a rather complicated phase transition. I just wanted to point out here that the magnetism can be studied very nicely uh, with, uh, with mu SR. And um, what you see in this right hand panel, you see the structural distortion in these materials that go from orthorhombic to tetragonal. And you also see the magnetism as measured by mu SR. And you can see that the structural transition occurs at a higher temperature than the magnetism. It's thought that the structural transition facilitates the magnetism. But the other interesting thing is, as you dope more, which is what induces the superconductivity, the magnetic transition goes down, as does the uh, structural transition, even with very small amounts of cobalt doping. And the other interesting thing is, when superconductivity sets in, which is when these curves go blue, which we've done to show the superconductivity, the order parameters actually go in the wrong direction. And so what you have is a competition between the structural, superconducting and magnetic order parameters. And when superconductivity turns on, the others get weaker. And this is a, a very nice thing to be able to probe using these techniques. OK, I just flashed a lot of examples in front of you, but I now want to come to the main part of the talk, um, which is on the muon site problem. So I'll first of all explain the problem, then I'll talk about these various solutions. So the muon. Um, we normally assume in mu SR that the muon is a harmless probe of the sample. So uh, you know this is a telegraph wire re representing the pristine crystal, and here is the muon. Uh, but what happens if the muon, when it's probing the sample, it actually perturbs it. How much effect does the muon have? Um, is it really measuring an intrinsic property, or is the presence of the muon very disruptive? So this is really the problem. Um, first of all, we don't know always where the muon is. Secondly, does it, does it give a significant perturbation? And can that change the physics that's probed? So this problem, I think, well, I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you the final answer. In most cases, there is no problem. But we are very worried when you have a sensitive ground state, like a spin liquid or, or, or something that you might have in a frustrated system, where the system is very, very carefully balanced between competing interactions. In that case, the presence of the muon could potentially have an effect. And that's what we want to understand. So there are, there are a number of problems in the field of mu SR persistent spin dynamics, spontaneous fields in non-centric symmetric superconductors, where we really want to understand what the muon is doing. So um, let me just explain the problem by just going back to one of these typical muon measurements. So this is the one I showed earlier. This is sodium iron arsenide. And what you see here at low temperature is two oscillations. There's a fast one and there's a slow one. So you see this beating pattern. The question is, 
that you really want to know is what's the size of the magnetic moment on the iron? That's the scientific question we would like to answer. And to be able to work that out, we need to know where the muon is. Or do we? So um, that's the scientific question. But, uh, and of course, we know the coupling, which is a dipolar coupling, but we don't know the muon site. So the first thought is we have to work out where the muon site is sitting. But sometimes in science, a way of solving a problem is seeing if you don't actually have to answer the question. And that's what we've done here. So ideally, you should know where the muon is, but can we get away without knowing? So my first solution is a Bayesian solution where we try and avoid the problem. You know, this is always the best tactic. Can you actually avoid the problem? So I'll tell you how far we can get with this. Now, what is Bayes' theorem? Maybe some of you know Bayes' theorem very well, but for those that don't, let me just explain this. Uh, uh, Thomas Bayes was a, a Presbyterian minister in the 18th century, but as well as being a, a, a man of the cloth, he also did some science as a hobby. And the thing that essentially in modern language that he showed was that there's an easy problem and a hard problem. Simulation is easy. Given the conclusion, you can simulate data. That's easy, relatively speaking. Inference is a hard problem. You've got the data, you want to get to the conclusion. And Bayes' theorem shows you how to invert the problem because Thomas Bayes proved that these things are proportional. In fact, in, in our language, if you know the magnetic moment, you can work out the frequency at any site. Um, on the other hand, what we've got is we've measured a frequency and we want to infer the magnetic moment, and that's hard. So Bayes' theorem basically says you can invert probabilities by using this equation. And of course, what you have to include are the so-called prior probabilities of A and B. And one of the ways you can get one of these probabilities is you can work it out by using this kind of sum. So if you've got, if, if you've got some other quantities you can say this depends on, you can work out one of these probabilities. So in our case, what we might do is our first prior probabilities is to say that without knowing anything, where do we think the muon site is? And if we are completely ignorant, it could be anywhere. But that's a starting position. OK, so um, I won't go through all of the details of this, but I'll just maybe tell you this is, this is how it works when you translate it into frequency and moment language. But let me just give you the procedure of what you do in this uh, approach. First of all, you assess your ignorance. This is always what you do in a Bayesian uh, solution. You try and say, how ignorant are you? Can you quantify this? You guess a magnetic structure, you compute the distribution of frequencies. That distribution scales with the magnetic moment. As the magnetic moments get bigger, all the frequencies get higher. Um, you use Bayes' theorem to invert the probability. This constrains your ignorance of the magnetic moment. And then you repeat this for other possible magnetic structures. In some cases, you have a very good guess for what the magnetic structure is on other physical grounds. OK, how well does it work? Um, well, uh, I'll show you in a moment. Maybe I should just say what your priors are. So the first prior is total ignorance. OK, always a good place to start. So if you don't know anything about the problem, the muon could be uniformly anywhere. So you assign it a uniform probability to be anywhere within the unit cell. And then the second thing you can do, because I work a lot in Switzerland, I think about the Swiss cheese model. And the Swiss cheese, at least some of them, has holes in. OK, so what you do is you you say, well, if there's already an atom there, the muon can't go there. So what I will do is I will take the unit cell, I will put holes in it where the atoms are, and then the muon can be anywhere in the cheese. OK, so that's your, that's your prior. OK, so um, this um, method has now been used in a number of different cases. So here, is, here are just some references. Um, I'll just show you one of them. So go back to this sodium ion arsenide. If you use these data, and you go through this procedure, then you estimate this is your probability of what, the mu of what the magnetic moment is. And in fact, you can see it's quite tightly bound using the Swiss cheese model, quite tightly bound between 0.06 and 0.08 Bohr magnetons, which is quite low. Um, now, it turns out that um, in this particular uh, material, it could also be measured using neutron scattering, and they get 0.09 plus or minus 0.04. Uh, but intriguingly, of course, with a, such a low moment, uh, 
This is um, quite hard to measure with neutron scattering because the size of a magnetic peak goes with the square of the moment. So small magnetic moments are very hard for, for neutrons to measure accurately. Um, even with total ignorance of the muon, si muon site, we get quite a good value um, in agreement with the neutron scattering uh, from this approach. OK, so that's the Bayesian solution. Um, let me tell you about another solution, first of all, uh, as a second possibility, and that's the use of fluorine. So it turns out that muons love fluorine. They love fluorine because uh, fluorine in many compounds is there as F minus. This is the most electronegative ion. So mu plus, being essentially a, a light proton, really will go for the F minus ion. And when it does that, you have a, a beautiful dipolar interaction between the muon and a nearby fluorine. So what happens in this particular case is that you get a resonant transfer of polarization between the muon and the fluorine. If you just solve the dipole Hamiltonian for these two, uh, um, uh, these two species, you get three energy levels, and then you get these various trans transitions, and uh, the black line here shows you the probability of the muon spin as a function of time um, and what you can see is you get this interesting beating pattern between these different frequencies. I'm also showing you a lower panel to show what the fluorines do, but you can't measure this. Um, now, in fact, very often what, you, what happens in, a, um, in materials is you get this so-called F mu F state. You get a more complicated series of energy levels, uh, and you get a more complicated beating pattern. Um, and interestingly, this is actually seen in experiments, so I, I won't go through the mathematics of how you work this out, it's a simple quantum problem. Um, but this is actually seen in many materials, so this transfer of polarization between the muon and the fluorines giving this beating pattern is seen in these materials. These are non-magnetic lead fluoride, tin fluoride, cadmium fluoride. So what you're seeing here is a resonant transfer of polarization between the muon and the fluorine ion, and you even see it in Teflon. PTFE. Uh, so um, this is a very common thing. But what you get from this is you get um, the frequency of these oscillations gives you the distance between the muon and the fluorine. So in this case, you know the muon site. So in any material that has fluorine in, we can pretty well localize the muon. I think of the fluorine being a helicopter landing pad for a, for a muon. You can attract the muon to this particular part on a complicated molecule. And we've done this now with a lot of molecular systems as well. Um, yes, these, um, these oscillations are very, very sensitive to the fluorine muon fluorine bond angle as well. The shapes of the oscillations change, uh, which you can simulate in a computer. Obviously, you can't get the, the bond to go as far around as that. But just to give you a few examples, in some complicated uh, organic materials, We've been able to, to localize the muon site um, uh, in this material where you actually interact with a single fluorine ion, in this one where you have an F mu F bond, uh, and also in this material where you have an HF2 minus ion. Um, in fact, something we've been working on very recently is, is, as well as thinking about the fluorine muon fluorine, is to think about the neighboring fluorines as well. They're further away, and what they tend to do is they lead, lead to decoherence. So you get a relaxation of these oscillations, which up until now we've always fitted using an exponential. Uh, but in fact, you can do it by considering, uh, you need large matrices to do this, but you can consider coherently all of the next nearest neighbor and next next nearest neighbor interactions. OK, now I come to the the final method, which is the one I'm going to spend my last uh, sort of seven minutes on, and that's uh, DFT plus mu. So DFT plus mu is the name we use in my group for this technique. It's essentially density functional theory with the added muon. And uh, the basic idea, it was, goes back quite a long way. Um, um, my group and also uh, Roberto de Renzi's group in Parma had a similar idea at a similar time and we thought why not look at fluorides because we know the answer. And what we do in these kinds of calculations and here are just a whole li list of um, some uh, references up to about 2016, there are many more since. What we do is we, um, in fact maybe I think I've got this on the next slide, what we essentially do is we numerically solve the lattice structures to determine the muon site. We relax a lattice, 
uh, in DFT, we then add a muon at different starting positions and then allow the structure to relax again and to find the lowest energy sites where the muon will, will sit. So there's some details here for the calculations. I can talk about those more later, but I won't, um, I won't um, go on about that now. So I want to give you an example of, of one thing that we've done uh, recently, which I think is a rather significant example of where things can go wrong. So normally when people talk about their experimental techniques, they give all the successes. I want to give one of the failures, uh, where the muon actually does have a, have a, a serious effect, uh, we believe. Now the, uh, the material I want to talk about is a pyrochlor. For those of you that don't know, pyrochlors are lattices uh, containing corner-sharing tetrahedra. And in these materials, they have a, a chemical formula A2B207. Um, the oxygens give you super exchange. The Bs are also important, but I'm now just going to concentrate only on the As. So this lattice here only shows you the As. And these are the magnetic ions. Um, they sit inside um, these AO8 environments. And essentially, the properties are all determined by the crystal field um, that the A ion uh, has. So depending on your choice of A ion, you can have a whole range of different si uh, states. You can have easy plane anisotropy. You can have easy axis anisotropy. Uh, you can have uh, spin ice states. And this is actually where I got interested in these materials because spin ices are fascinating systems. Um, now, the kind of materials I'm going to be talking about are ones which are uh, rare earths. And there you have this interesting thing that you can have Kramers or non Kramers ground states, depending on whether you have an odd number of electrons or an even number of electrons. So you can just choose your lanthanide ion and it's Kramers or non Kramers. Now, um, the famous material here is dysprosium titanate. This has this dysprosium ion in and this shows spin ice properties. Um, here is dysprosium titanate with some muon measurements. I won't go into the details, but essentially, the behavior is consistent with a frozen spin ice ground state. So this is something we looked at um, a number of years ago. Uh, and there was a big controversy, but I won't go into that. So we know that the internal field is around about half a tesla, and there is a frozen spin ice ground state at low temperature. More recently, people have got interested in this compound, praseodymium stannate. It's also a spin ice material, but the praseodymium ion um, is non kramers It has a 4F2 ground state, and this gives you a ground state doublet. So this is a spin a half material, essentially, effective spin a half, in contrast to dysprosium titanate, which has a very large spin. Um, now, the, the properties of this material um, show uh, a spin ice-like behavior. Uh, we did some muon measurements on it, and we didn't see spin ice behavior. We saw something that looked like static magnetism. So we saw what in the muon community is well known as a cubo terabi relaxation, which actually goes all the way up to high temperature. And if you fit the so-called cubo terabi delta parameter, which tells you about the size of the internal field, essentially, uh, it shows this very odd temperature dependence. Now, this behavior is inconsistent with a frozen spin ice ground state, even though other techniques say that you should have one. So this was worrying. What's more interesting is that the size of this delta is a bit too large to be a nuclear effect. So the whole thing looks puzzling. And what's also uh, rather intriguing, we thought maybe it's something special about praseodymium stannate, but we did praseodymium stannate, zirconate, hafnate. Someone else had done praseodymium iridate, and they all show the same thing. So there's something odd about this material. Um, so they all show this, this strange uh, temperature dependence. And the measured static fields seem too big for nuclear effects. OK, so we did the DFT plus mu calculations to find the muon site. You do an electrostatic potential. That gives you some possible starting states. But then you have to relax the structure. I'll just focus on the, um, on, on, on the final state. Here is the, here is the muon. It's this green um, in the lattice. But I think I'll show you that the next picture is, I think, a better way of looking to see what's going on. So here is inside the praseodymium stannate lattice. The praseodymium is the yellow iron. The oxygen is red. And uh, what I'm doing here is interpolating between no muon and muon, because the eye is very good at detecting motion. So what you can see is when, the, when you put the muon in the sample, 
it looks like it's growing up as a balloon, but you can see that this bond here is rotating, this oxygen is going around to meet the muon. And you can see some other ions are moving as well. Um, now another way of representing this is the picture I showed right at the beginning. So here is, I've got rid of the tin. There is praseodymium, oxygen, and uh, now I put the muon in. And you see what happens, this bond bends and this bond lengthens. But in fact the environment around these two ions is then completely changed and this affects the crystal field. And uh, we know this because we can, do, um, we can do crystal field calculations. So this is without the muon. The red here shows you doublets. Um, and when you put the muon on for these different sites, one, two, and three, which is this one, two, and three, you can see that the ground state doublet splits by different amounts. And this splitting changes the local properties. And this turns out to be very important. There is a theory from uh, uh, hyperfine enhancement that essentially requires on having ground state singlets. And then you get hyperfine enhancement of the praseodymium moments. And there is a theory from, uh, uh, from Brebis Blini in the 1970s, which we adapted for the muon case, which we can then use to fit these curves. And this gives us an independent estimate of the crystal field splittings, which agree with very well with what we've got from our DFT plus mu calculations. So the, the net result of this is what we think is happening. The muon is going in, causing this distortion, changing crystal fields. The crystal field is producing then a singlet ground state. You then get hyperfine enhancement of the praseodymium moments, and that dominates the, uh, dominates the observed behavior. So uh, these uh, experiments on these, these compounds are completely dominated by this muon site-induced effect. Now we've repeated these calculations for other spin ice materials. I'm not going to go through the, the details of this except to say uh, that when you do that, for example in dysprosium titanate, this has a Kramer's ground state. So although you change the excited state uh, levels, the ground state remains a doublet. So in dysprosium titanate, this effect doesn't occur. In holmium titanate, um, it is a non kramers ground state, but it turns out the matrix elements are such that you don't really split the ground state by very much. So in holmium titanate, everything is fine. So I'll come now to my uh, conclusions. Um, essentially, I think I'll, this is my conclusion slide. We now have a number of ways of, of uh, trying to solve the muon site problem. We either ignore it and use this Bayesian method, we use fluorine to localize the muon, or we can now use DFT plus mu to really get very good understanding of what the muon site is to understand the distortions. In most cases, the distortions have no effect, but we have now found one case where it does. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this.